Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm so excited to be here and meet all of you and talk to you about quantum computing. So my name is Gwen Praviro Atmojo. I am, uh, just like Rick, a quantum engineer at Rigetti Computing. Although Rick is mostly focused on uh, the experimental part, I'm mostly focused on the software part of our full stack. So Rigetti is a full stack quantum computing company. That means we are uh, engineering the hardware as well as the software. And what I'm gonna talk to you uh, today about is uh, quantum hardware and how to use it. So I'm gonna talk to you a bit about the full stack. So not just the software that's the forest part, but also the software that's the lower stack, the part, the part of the lower stack. So if you're like me and you like taking things apart and putting them back together again and then hope they still work, now you'll probably recognize what this is. So this is the, uh, the motherboard and basically the guts of a MacBook Pro. And uh, here you see the battery, you see the, the memory, and uh, you see the processor here. So in a quantum computer, um, the processor is basically the chip that, that Rick showed this uh, with the qubits and so forth. Um, so you see, you see basically here, there's this bar in front of the processor, which is linked to these big fans. And uh, if you're curious and you want to see what's under it, this is actually, uh, this is the processor right here. And then there's this piece of metal right here with this thermal paste. So um, you might know why it's like this. So um, a, a, actually a processor heats itself up when you use it. And um, the goal of this heat sink is to cool it back down to the optimal temperature at which it operates. Um, this is very important because, uh, you know, if it gets too hot, you get like blue screens of death or it's, it freezes. Um, and a quantum computer actually also has an optimal operating temperature. Um, it's just much, much lower than a real, like than a classical processor. So what you see here is a dilution refrigerator. A dilution refrigerator uses liquid helium to cool down um, a quantum chip to almost the absolute zero temperature, just minus 273 degrees Celsius. And um, what you see here is all these tubes and so on. They have like the, the helium flowing through it. And um, basically what you see here is, is, is not very unlike this thermos. So, so if you guys know how a thermos works, there's like a layer of vacuum in between like the inside of the, of the bottle and the outside, which insulates it from the environment such that you can either have a cold or a hot beverage inside. It's gonna retain the temperature. So it's the same for this this uh, fridge, as we call it, by illusion refrigerator, it takes a bit long to say, so we just call it a fridge. This is what it looks like on the inside. So what you see here is uh, different stages. So every stage, get, as you go down, it gets colder and colder. Uh, and the bottom stage over here is what we call the mixing chamber plate. It gets as cold as 10 millikelvin. And um, this is actually, so this is a pretty neat picture from the bottom of the fridge. Over here, where you see what we call the sample holder, which contains the quantum processor. So you've seen this picture before. This is where we actually um, mount our chips, our, our quantum processors, and connect them to all the cables that go through all of these stages. And there's a bunch of filters here and all kinds of different like, amplifiers that make sure we can read all those tiny quantum signals very well. So what's actually inside uh, a quantum processor? I thought it would be nice to compare it to a, a CPU or a central processing unit from like a computer, a classical computer. So if you open that up, this is what it looks like. Um, so there's a bunch of, uh, well, they're, they're really small, but there's a lot of transistors on here. So a transistor is one of the switching elements. It can be one, it's either zero or one. And one of the main differences between a classical computer and a quantum computer is that in a classical computer, the data flows through the circuit, flows through the gates. So what's on here are different gates, like an AND, an OR, XOR, inverter, all these different gates that you, that you may be familiar with. And the signals that flow through is the data. So this is zeros and ones. So it's like a current that's on or off, that's flowing through. While in a quantum computer, so here you see our, our 8Q, we're getting, uh, QPU, quantum processing unit. Let's see here, here we take up off the cap. Here is actually the data is on the chip. So the quantum information is represented by the circuits that are drawn into the aluminum. 
So that means that the operation is actually in the inverse of how a classical computer works. So here you have data flowing through the circuit, and here you have actually the circuit going to the data. So you have pulses that you send to the data to manipulate it, and the data stays right here um, on the chip. And um, this chip is fabricated using um, e-beam lithography, using metal deposition, all kinds of um, nano fabrication processes. And uh, here's a picture of our fab in Fremont, which was opened in June. This is the world first nano fabrication facility solely dedicated to making quantum processors. And it's right here in California. And uh, yeah, what you see here is uh, basically this is one of those metal deposition chambers. So this is for, for depositing the uh, aluminum and the oxide that's in the junction. Um, and all kinds of different equipment needed to do analysis and, and other kinds of um, processing steps. So as, uh, as my colleague Rick mentioned before, is, uh, is that we send these pulses. These are actually representing the gates. And uh, you can also represent a qubit uh, on a sphere, which we call a block sphere. Um, so uh, as a transistor can be zero or one, a qubit can be something in between as well. So we like to represent it on a sphere because it also has phase information, which is this axis over here. So you have this axis, which you use to read it out. And then you have this axis, which contains the quantum information, which is what makes a quantum computer powerful. So for example, if I send it a pulse like this, and now it should animate, bam. I just rotated the qubit to, you wanna see it again? <laughs> I just rotated a qubit on the block sphere from the ground state to the excited state, or from zero to one. Right, so this is what we call a knot, or a pi pulse, a pi, an x pi rotation. Now, this is also Rick also mentioned, we can do something really cool. We can take the same pulse and we can take half of the amplitude and then we can send it again. And now it's only gonna rotate halfway. So this actually happens on that chip. This state goes into this in-between position. Now you may say like, okay, what the hell? Is it now zero or one? Or am I gonna measure like 0.5 or something like? No, you're actually gonna measure zero or you're gonna measure one. We're going to map it onto the z-axis. However, half the time, oh, I have uh, some, some Apple thing. Um, <laughs> not now. All right, it's working, so I don't have to install a driver. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, so it's gonna be either either a zero or I'm gonna measure one. Half the time, let's say I do this 1,000 times, then 500 times I'm gonna measure zero and 500 times I'm gonna measure one, so I can take the average of that and I'm gonna get 0.5. So now I'm gonna talk about quantum mechanics. I think somebody in the audience asked about it, like Rick briefly mentioned it and teased a bit about it a bit. So quantum entanglement is basically when you when you have two qubits, and they have some uh, interaction between them. So Einstein called this a uh, spooky action at a distance. So I'm gonna explain to you why it's spooky. So I'll, I'll use an analogy to describe it. So let's say I have two boxes, and there are quantum boxes. Let's say they're not normal boxes, but quantum boxes. And I put uh, two cubes in every box, one says zero and one says one, and I put them in the box. And I close the box and I shake it. Right, and then I'm going to blindly take one box from the left, one, one cube from the left box, and one cube from the right box, right? Now everybody who's had like basic combinatorics knows there's like four outcomes. So I can have zero, zero, I can have zero, one. So I pick a zero from left and one from the right. I can pick up one from the left and a zero from the right, or I can pick two ones, right? So let's say I do this a thousand times, then uh, 25% of the time, I'm gonna get zero, zero, 25% zero, one, et cetera, right? Every, it's more or less, right? Maybe some, some, some deviations, but uh, if I do this 1,000 times, I get 250 times every outcome. Now, I'm gonna do something special. I'm gonna entangle my quantum boxes. What happens when I do entanglement, I can actually change the probability distribution of what comes out of this box which is pretty spooky, right? Because that means that if I have a zero, if I pick a zero out of this box, then I know for certain I'm gonna pick a zero in the other box. So actually really what this means is that the left box, the outcome is gonna influence what comes out of the right box. So this is what quantum entanglement is. And 
Now we're going to take it back to qubits. So how do you actually do this with qubits, right? So with quantum box, it makes no sense. We don't have a quantum box, we have qubits. What we do is we, we, we take two qubits, and does this actually work? Can you see something? Here. Yeah, it's okay, thank you. So I'm gonna take two qubits, and I'm gonna take the left one and put it in the superposition state, so that's the zero, one in between state. Then I'm gonna take another qubit and I'm gonna initialize it in the ground state in zero. And then I'm going to apply a C naught pulse. And what this does, C naught stands for conditional knot. So I'm gonna take the first qubit as the condition to flipping the second one. So that means if I measure this and I get zero, then I'm not going to flip this. And if I get a one, then I'm going to flip this. That means is that the outcome is going to be either 0, 0 or 1, 1. So that means the outcome of this one is going to influence this one. So why, why do we want to do this, right? Why, how can we actually do computation with this? Like how is this useful? So these are the list of uh, quantum instructions that you have in a quantum computer. So there's the, the naught, there's the Hadamard, there's the, the Z, and then the C naught, and measure there's also swap, which I left out of here. And um, uh, these you can use to make quantum circuits. And one of them is uh, like what, what Rick explained, the Shor algorithm and the Grover's algorithm. And at Rigetti, we actually uh, developed our own quantum instruction language. So if you have these drawings, you cannot really give them to a computer. You can't make a drawing and say, okay, compute this, right? So what we actually did is we, we took all these different kinds of gates and we turned them into instructions. So a quantum program will actually look like something that a computer can read and execute. So I'm just gonna give you a quick um, code example of, uh, of Quill. So let's say I wanna make one of those entangled states. And this is what the circuit would look like if I make the drawing. So I take two qubits and I perform a Hadamard on one of them, which rotates it into, into this equator. And then I'm gonna perform a C naught, which makes them entangled. So this is sort of the notation you use to say I'm gonna get either zero, zero, or I'm gonna get one, one, and I have to normalize it. So divide by square root of two. So if we translate this into Quill, then this is what it would look like. So this is something like a software engineer really likes, right? I think this is like, I can actually debug this and I can run, run this. Right, so yeah, so Hanamard on qubit B, C naught on, on, on A with B as conditional, and I can call it uh, entangle. So a little bit of more uh, a sophisticated example, quantum teleportation. So I'm not actually teleporting a guy. Here I'm, I'm gonna teleport a, cube, uh, a quantum state, right? So I'm gonna have three qubits, and we're gonna um, teleport the state from this qubit to this qubit. So this is what the circuit looks like. It's very similar to the one I showed before. So the, the part over here actually uh, is entangling those two qubits. And then I do a Bell measurement here which gives me some information about the phase and about the, the, the energy. And then I, uh, I do these conditional operations on this qubit, and then I have teleported this state psi from this qubit to this qubit. So on the x-axis is time. So these are the different pulses I apply to modify the qubits. And uh, this is what it looks like in, uh, in Quill code. So this is actually pretty cool. I posted this example on the, the Forest channel, and uh, James Weaver over here is gonna give a talk later, actually made a template for this in PyQuill, uh, sorry, in PyCharm. So you can actually code using like this uh, sort of syntax highlighting now in Quill. Um, yeah, so just to quickly give you an overview of Forest. So Forest is our, our quantum computing environment. So how do you actually compile code, right? So you take this quill, right? And you, you, you build it in either like an IPython notebook or, or something like that, and you send it to the cloud. Like, how does it actually translate into these gate operations? Um, so what you do is you send it to the cloud and then it gets sent to our worker, which is uh, located on premises, which is going to translate it into a pulse program. So this is actually doing the compiling of the code then this gets sent to our, our QPU, which is this uh, in this big dilution refrigerator in, uh, in Berkeley. 
Uh, then that gets translated on the chip into some qubit operation. So it's going to live in uh, this quantum state, what you coded. Um, and then we do readouts. So as I said, like you read out the state and you're going to get some single shots, like either zero or one. So you're going to get a lot of zeros and ones. Um, and then you do some averaging or filtering. And then it gets sent back to, to the, um, the circuit that you were running. And the, the whole loop starts over. Yeah, so that was my talk. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the meetup. And uh, I can answer one or two questions.